All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Carrie Dietz, and I'm the manager at Cabinet Library. Welcome to Ruth Porter and St. Louis Community Organizing in the Civil Rights Era. Before we begin today's program, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Please keep your microphone on mute to help us reduce background noise. We'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question, please send it through the chat button. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the program. Also, today's program is being recorded and will be available at a later date on the St. Louis Public Library's YouTube channel. This afternoon, I would like to introduce Robert Stregwerda. Robert is an 11-year resident of the West End, chair of the Cabinet History Project, and board member of West End Neighbors. Robert will give a brief presentation um, before introducing our guest. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome him today. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Uh, uh, let me just uh, give some identification. Uh, West End Neighbors is the neighborhood association of both Visitation Park and West End. Uh, the Cabinet History Project, of which I'm chair, is a group of local residents interested in the history of the old Cabinet neighborhood of St. Louis. It was bounded by North Kings Highway, Page Avenue, the West City boundary, uh, along with uh, University City, and then Demar Boulevard, Boulevard back to Kings Highway. Uh, the Cabinet neighborhood was later subdivided into Academy Sherman Park, Hamilton Heights, Visitation Park, and the West End neighbors, neighbors, yeah, rather neighbor, neighborhood. Uh, so I put our uh, email and some information on the chat. You can check that out. Uh, we uh, want to thank our co-sponsor, the St. Louis Public Library, uh, and especially Carrie Dietz for co-sponsoring and supplying the uh, Zoom facilities. Uh, over a hundred years ago, the Cabinet uh, Library was a meeting place for the Equal Suffrage League of St. Louis, so which uh, gets the really the women's history off to a really good start, so it's appropriate for this to be held during uh, Women's History Month. When I first moved to the neighborhood and looked into the history of our area, I was immediately struck by the name of the parks. Gwen Giles, Marie Fowler, Ivory Perry, and of course, Ruth Porter. Who were all these amazing people? One of Cabinet history motivations is to study these, bring them to light, and to help our children realize that they too can do wonderful things. So uh, when we saw that our own state Senator Carla May had gotten state legislation passed recognizing March 26th today as Empowering Black Women's Day. We decided to help honor that by sponsoring today's talk. Uh, we hope it will be the first of many celebrations. Uh, Senator May had a, a commitment that it went to one o'clock and she said she would take some time to get uh, linked in. So we're gonna have her speak after uh, Dr. Izzo. Uh, so my colleague, Dr. Amanda Izzo, teaches for the Women and Gender Studies Department at St. Louis University. Her PhD is from Yale University in American Studies. She is author of Liberal Christianity and Women's Global Activism, the YWCA of the US and the Mary Knoll Sisters. That was published by Rutgers University Press. Most recently, she has published in the Missouri Historical Review an article entitled, quote, to help them brush aside the limitations that hold them back. Ruth Porter, liberal inter interracialism and St. Louis organizing in the civil rights era. She's continuing that re research. And so her talk today is based on all of that research she's been doing. It is my pleasure to introduce and uh, to welcome Amanda Izzo. Thank you so much, Robert. It is absolutely an honor uh, to have the opportunity to talk about uh, this pioneering activist and community organizer. 
I'd like to say, thank Senator Carla May for her help in recognizing and commemorating these critical legacies whose lessons are so timely. Many thanks to Cabinet Library for letting me be part of the Women's History Month celebration and more generally to the St. Louis Public Library for its great programming. I'm grateful that they do not limit the celebration and commemoration of these histories to just one or two months a year. Uh, many thanks to Robert, uh, to the Cabinet History Project and the West End Neighbors uh, for, for your interest in this work. Now what I intend, intend to do today is speak for about a half hour. Um, and then I'd like to hear, we'll hopefully hear from Senator May, and I'd love to hear your questions, your thoughts, your memories. Uh, my talk aims to enrich understandings of the region's civil rights history by illuminating Ruth Porter's time in St. Louis. It's taken, as Robert said, from a longer article I published in the Missouri Historical Review in April 2021, based on archival research and interviews. Um, and I'm going to share my screen with you now for a little slideshow. Um, if you're not new to Zoom, you can kind of, you, you should see a little box with my talking head in it. You can move that box around if you'd like to look at the slides more closely. I was inspired to do this project because as a citizen of the St. Louis and as a scholar of his history, I encountered Mrs. Porter's name in a number of contexts. And despite the city's rich civil rights heritage, it possesses only a handful of memorials to local movement leaders. And one such memorial is the Ruth C. Porter Mall, a linear walk a park and walkway bisecting the city's West End neighborhood. Her name also pops up on, in scholarship on local civil rights activism, but it's a name that's referenced frequently in passing, not as a main character. This neglect is perhaps uh, paralleled uh, by the deterioration and then demolition of that 1983 mural bordering the Porter Mall that celebrated her achievements. Uh, the, the image I was just showing. Um, finding that there was not a lot of accessible information about who she was and what she accomplished, I set out to document some of the missing pieces of the picture. Living in St. Louis from 1959 until her untimely death in 1967, Mrs. Porter dedicated herself to the elimination of housing barriers and the expansion of needed social services, especially for Black populations. But her impact did not come as a result of direct influence that she gained over urban policymaking or technocratic government agencies, nor was she a visible participant in the grassroots direct action protests that animate most uh, historical accounts of the civil rights movement in 1960s St. Louis. Instead, she was one of many middle-class leaders who sought to transform the nation by building vehicles for the formation of relationships that stretched across the boundaries of race and class. And in this, Mrs. Porter drew heavily from her experience in organizing neighborhoods and in working in women's clubs. And these types of groups asserted that the cultivation of healthy face-to-face -face human connections, along with vigorous civic engagement, could mitigate the social inequalities manifest in racialized poverty, residential segregation, and educational disparities. Mrs. Porter's uh, story can give us larger generalizable insights into how Black women made change happen in the mid 20th century. And so my work builds off the foundations of really good, just outstanding local scholars who have explored those questions, particularly Vanessa Gary, scholar of ed, uh, education and historian Priscilla Dowden White, uh, both at UMSL, and Kiana Irvin, a scholar of history at the University of Missouri. But my talk today is designed to give a little bit of how Mrs. Porter got here in St. Louis on what her most prominent activist efforts were in this city. As the youngest of nine children growing up in the Jim Crow South, Ruth Porter must have learned at an early age that she would have to find inventive ways to make her voice heard. 
She was born on July 13, 1913 in Pine Bluff, Arkansas to William and Josephine Townsend. Her parents were key players in the city's educational system, members of a black bourgeoisie that was measured less by wealth than by cultural capital. Her parents who were born in the deep South in the 1860s both had bachelor's degrees from the nation's first land grant college established for African Americans. Imagine what a monumental accomplishment and distinction that was. Her mother taught school and raised children, while her father served as principal of the city's flagship school for black students, Merrill High School. Um, and Robert mentioned uh, Ivory Perry, another famous St. Louis activist, also from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. He graduated from Merrill High School uh, when Ruth, Porter fought, Ruth Porter's father was a the principal there. Uh, William Townsend belonged to the NAACP and the family worshiped at the AME Church. Uh, the city of Pine Bluff later acknowledged uh, uh, Mr. Townsend's achievements in institution building by naming uh, Park in an elementary school after him. Uh, like many Southerners in this era of great migration, Josephine Townsend sought new horizons. And in the 1920s, she moved uh, to Chicago. She took some of the children, but her youngest Ruth initially was not permitted to go, though she badly wanted to leave. Ruth Porter's daughter, Janice Gump, told me. Eventually, Ruth joined three of her sisters who acted as guardians after their mother's 1930 death. And in Chicago, Ruth made appearances in the social pages of the Defender as a soror of Delta Sigma Theta. She completed coursework, though not a degree, at the Lewis Institute, a commuter college with a diverse student population. While Mrs. Porter's path into adulthood continued to follow a trajectory of economic security and social privilege, it was not a retreat into the comforts of domesticity. She married William G. Porter, Bill, in 1935, and her husband worked in the Chicago distribution office of Anheuser-Busch, and the couple had three children, Janice, William, and Diane. It took time to establish herself as a community organizer, but Ruth Porter's political consciousness consistently manifested itself in voluntary and paid labor that she undertook as a young wife and mother. She found an outlet with women's clubs, becoming involved with peace programming at the YWCA and the National, uh, Dis the, yeah, National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Uh, she also got involved with neighborhood groups as she helped raise her family on the South Side. Inspired by an atmosphere where community-based mobilizations use the language of democracy and the tools of citizenship to fight against social division, Mrs. Porter made her way to interracial political organizations pursuing solutions to post-war struggles over race and urban space. And I won't detail this Chicago work. I'll just point out that what she learned organizing in interracial neighborhood groups there, she brought with her to St. Louis. And why did she end up in St. Louis? because Bill Porter had been appointed national sales representative and assistant to the vice president at Anheuser-Busch's national headquarters in St. Louis in the mid fifties. His promotion was nationally publicized as a great stride for black leaders in corporate America. And eventually he would become the company's marketing director and then its first black vice president, earning recognition for his groundbreaking efforts in marketing to black consumers. Ruth Porter also secured a promotion of sorts by moving to St. Louis, which she did in 1959. In Chicago, her influence had been constrained by the inadequate resources of neighborhood organizations with which she worked, as well as by the crowded field of South Side neighborhood activism. In relocating, she found mobilizing opportunities that conferred greater authority and greater visibility. Tragically, Porter only had eight years to make an imprint on the city. And she did so by pursuing several intersecting avenues of community organizing. With the West End Community Conference, she joined her efforts to a neighborhood organization that addressed urban renewal and school segregation. At the Kinlock YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association, where she worked from 1961 to 64, she used the platform of a women's club to craft what she called my junior sized poverty program. Setting her sights on housing discrimination in the metropolitan area, she made a transition from volunteer board member to executive director of the Greater St. Louis Committee for Freedom of Residence, 
fashioning herself into a public expert on open housing issues. Finally, shortly before her death, she ran for state level public office, hoping to parlay the inst institutional and interpersonal connections she had forged into the ability to craft government policy. She arrived in St. Louis at a time of intensification of the civil rights struggle, and she moved to the West End at 6030 Cates Avenue. So at that time, the neighborhood, what, what they were calling the West End at that time, uh, it was defined as the area between Del Mar, Union, Page, and Hodiamock. So much broader than uh, what is called the West End now, really encompassing, I think, all of those neighborhoods that Robert detailed in his introduction. Um, at the moment of Porter's arrival, that neighborhood, that area, was grappling with the tremendous fallout from the clearance of Mill Creek Valley the Midtown neighborhood where some 20,000 residents, mostly African-American, were forced out of their homes in advance of urban renewal. With vast swaths of the region remaining closed to black residency, displaced families from Mill Creek Valley joined the steady stream of new migrants to the city, crowding into the neighborhoods of the recently opened Northwest side. Under those circumstances, the West End experienced a startlingly quick demographic transition. A 1963 newspaper article stated that it had gone from 98% white in 1950 to 64% black only a decade later. In response, in, 1950, in 1955, West End residents, anxious to maintain the character of the neighborhood, as one reporter put it, created the West End Community Conference, or what I'll call the WECC. In this era, rhetoric about neighborhood maintenance and character often functioned as a euphemism for racist fears of Black invasion. The WECC, however, couched its call for neighborhood preservation in a liberal and anti-racist politics. In publicity and education efforts, members identified the problems facing the neighborhood as the malign result of discriminatory housing policy and real estate practices. And these things manifested themselves in exploitative leases and dangerous subdivision of rental properties, in school overcrowding, and in the continued neglect of already deteriorating housing stock. As solutions, the WECC called for legislation that would guarantee, quote, a free, competitive, and democratic housing market, as well as smaller scale efforts, such as the elimination of racial preferences in newspaper housing listings. In joining the WECC, Mrs. Porter became part of a well-established activist network dedicated to neighborhood-based preservation and development projects. By the end of the 1960s, the WECC had successfully lobbied to have the area designated a renewal zone, deserving of federal funding for stabilization and improvements, while vigorously obstructing municipal efforts to undertake large-scale clearance. They managed to prevent the West End from becoming a barren landscape, as Mill Creek Valley had become. Mrs. Porter contributed her labor to the WECC's youth programming. She helped organize Kinder Cottage, an interracial and ecumenical preschool pro program sponsored by a group of organizations that included the WECC and First Unitarian Church, where Mrs. Porter worshiped. Anticipating the federal government's Head Start program by a year, Kinder Cottage was designed to provide so-called culturally deprived children a foundation for future academic success. Mrs. Porter also formed a short-lived offshoot of the WECC named Community Resources. This was an attempt to re avert the resegregation of city schools, which had successfully navigated a 1950s desegregation program. Mrs. Porter joined the executive committee of the local chapter of the NAACP, but she shifted her energies away from that group after her participation in an acrimonious and unsuccessful attempt to unseat the group's leadership block. Mrs. Porter also became involved with the Greater St. Louis Committee for Freedom of Residents, or FOR, first as a volunteer and then as its executive director. And this is really where she made her name in the city. The Post-Dispatch reported on the group, which formed around 1960, 
as follows. Prominent St. Louisans launched the FOR to bring about orderly integration in housing in the metropolitan area. With an initial membership of around 100 people from fashionable areas of the city and county, the group convened to break down housing restrictions in their own neighborhoods. Mrs. Porter was a founding member of the FOR, but by the time she was hired as an executive a director in 1965, the organization had achieved considerable regional visibility in the fight for public housing or open housing. Now, what do I mean by open housing? The open housing of the open housing was a front of the civil rights struggle. And it was one kind of piece of the civil rights movement, and it came about in the years between these tentative judicial anti-discrimination decisions that happened in the late 1940s and federal enforcement mechanisms and mandates that went into the effect in the late 1960s and beyond. So the Supreme Court's 1948 Shelley versus Kramer decision in a case that of course originated in North St. Louis had been a watershed in fighting against residential segregation. But what it did was render racially restrictive housing covenants unenforceable by the courts. As the decision's aftermath would show, those covenants were not necessary at all for the survival of segregated and inequitable housing markets. There were a proliferation of means by which local governmental entities could deploy the power of the state to shore up exclusions. And at the same time, real estate industry and white property owners protected by the freedom of contract, controlled areas available for black settlement through informal compacts and private decisions. In concert with urban renewal policies and clearance projects that extirpated black neighborhoods in the city, this confederation of public and private actors had a chokehold on black communities throughout metropolitan St. Louis in the mid-century and beyond. So this is a time when civil rights sentiment is gaining purchase while effective policy change lagged. And the FOR became the most prominent among a lively regional network of organizations that debated strategies on how to break that chokehold. The government was saying, you can't discriminate, but we're not going to do anything to disrupt it. And private companies and individuals, white folks are saying, this is not my problem. It's a private market. We can do what we want. And the FOR stood out because of the dedication of its volunteers and the reputation of its interracial and interfaith board of community leaders. People like Martin Katzenstein, the senior rabbi uh, of the Temple Israel Congregation, and Donald Suggs, an oral surgeon who is then just establishing his presence in philanthropy and civic life. It was recognized that a chain of ethical commitments was in some sense critical for holding together systemic racial discrimination in the real estate industry. And so groups like the FOR appealed to the moral sensibilities of various actors in that system. Mrs. Porter brought many assets to a campaign that struck that tone. Due to her fluency with the conciliatory language of interracial community development and her ability to connect with diverse audiences, she reached a high point of success in her activist career by using the FOR to stage bridge work of interpersonal encounter and community education bringing in people into the civil rights struggle from where they were as neighbors and as citizens. The FOR staked out a not uncommon place in the open housing movement, seeking to educate both, quote, the victims of discrimination and those committing the act, according to scholar Vanessa Gary. The group directed moral suasion at white audiences to reduce their hostility towards residential integration, and it endeavored to establish middle-class black families as ambassadors of desegregation. De the organization did not envision a radical challenge to white people who fretted about the pace of civil rights reforms. FO, the FOR would grow more radical in the late 1960s and 1970s. However, in its early years, it bypassed thorny problems at the intersection of racial discrimination and economic disenfranchisement by stressing conciliatory themes. With an intention to, quote, devote, develop a climate of acceptance whereby good neighbors of any race or creed may be welcomed to full participation in neighborhood life, unquote, the FOR programming initially centered on public relations campaigns which was an area of specialization for Porter. 
for Mrs. Porter. Um, activities like pledge card drives and the distribution of good neighbor stickers that read, I will welcome all people as my neighbors, regardless of race, color, or creed. These types of things aim to make support for integration both visible and unexceptional to ordinary St. Louisans. The organization's members agreed broadly on a liberal vision for moving the civil rights movement forward, but they lacked consensus on concrete strategies and goals. Mrs. Porter optimistically endorsed the power of interracial cooperation to overcome structural inequalities, but she remained committed to advancing confrontational practices, uh, confrontational responses to discriminatory practices. While much of the FOR's public relations um, uh, work summoned a cooperative spirit of shared civic value, it didn't preclude aggressive responses to acts of injustice. Under Porter's direction, the FOR stepped up its services in the form of referrals and investigations and solicited queries uh, from African-Americans seeking home ownership and apartment rentals, particularly in the suburbs. Sometimes these queries were answered with referrals to integration friendly companies and neighborhoods. At other times, they sparked amateur investigations into discriminatory practices. The FOR would send white people to inquire about apartment rentals and house showings at places where African Americans had been turned away. The outcomes of such investigations included confrontations with real estate companies, press attention, and on the few occasions, such as the slide shown here, picketing. An uncorroborated recollection from activist Hetty Epstein, who worked for the FOR in the late 1960s, asserted that the shifting winds of the open housing fight gave the organization unlikely momentum. The FOR was able to hire Porter as an executive director in 1965, according to Epstein, through the clandestine support of the Metropolitan Home Builders Association. It was an effort to bolster moderate advocates for policy changes that were clearly on the horizon. And so housing developers apparently secretly transferred funds to the FOR by hiding a bag of cash in Forest Park. The same year, the year that uh, uh, Ruth Porter was hired, the FOR would initiate its most consequential act, which was a civil suit that became a landmark Supreme Court case, Jones versus Meyer. The plaintiffs in the case, Joseph Lee Jones and Barbara Jo Jones, were an interracial couple of middle-class means seeking housing in a new development in an unincorporated St. Louis suburb. They tried to buy in a subdivision built by Alfred Mayer, one of the region's most successful developers, uh, but their offer was refused. And Samuel Lieberman II, a young lawyer uh, active in the FOR, responded to the Jones request for assistance with an innovative legal challenge. Filing suit against Meyer and his associated corporations, Lieberman claimed there was violations of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the 14th Amendment, but the unexpected strategy was also a violation of the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery and the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And the Supreme Court eventually agreed in 1968, giving a majority decision that refusal to sell to the Joneses and by extension, racial property, racial discrimination in property transactions, individual property transactions, constituted a violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and its interference with the right to own and rent property, as well as a violation of the 13th Amendment and its perpetuation of the effects of slavery. As that case wound its way to the Supreme Court, Ruth Porter mustered her ambitions for public office and launched a campaign in mid-1966 to run for the 72nd district seat of the Missouri House of Representatives, which covered the West End neighborhood. It was a newly drawn district and it was now newly majority black. Black women were just beginning to make inroads in statewide elected offices, with fellow St. Louis community organizer Deverne Calloway, the first to be elected to Missouri, the Missouri House in 1962. Mrs. Porter took on a white incumbent, businessman Harry Rafey, who had represented the area since 1952. And the competition for that solidly democratic seat occurred in the primary race. Mrs. Porter positioned herself as a scourge of municipal machine corruption, and she had good cause to do so. It had become public knowledge that Rafi did not meet residency requirements for the district, 
He filed for office under the address of an apartment above his business, which was located in the West End, but he lived in the adjacent suburb of University City. Porter took to the press with a photograph of Rafi's automobile parked in the garage of his suburban home to disprove his residency claims. In waging her campaign, Mrs. Porter cited her community organizing experience and underscored the value of having a black candidate represent what had become a majority black district. But the charges of fraud lobbied at Rafi received the most traction in the press. In addition to uh, his residency ineligibility, Mrs. Porter claimed that the incumbent was secretly funding other black candidates in the primary. Tavern owners indebted to him, she said, in an attempt to divide the black vote. The disposition of these concerns indicates the barriers that Porter faced as a black woman trying to break the political glass ceiling in the 1960s. The state legislature did not investigate the claims. West End residents filed suit challenging Rafi's eligibility, but that suit was dismissed in circuit court. The governor contravening a very well publicized commitment to neutrality in local primaries visited St. Louis to show support for Rafi. And despite enthusiastic endorsements from black newspapers and from the Post Dispatch, Mrs. Porter lost the primary. And predictions of the fragmentation of the black vote were borne out in the results, where five opposing candidates collectively secured 1,485 votes to Rafi's 923. Mrs. Porter came in second, losing by 94. And when she successfully petitioned to run in the general election as an independent, Rafi briefly withdrew from the race, a move that was attributed to fear that Mrs. Porter would defeat him in the general election. She did not, but the threat that she had posed prompted the Missouri legislature to bar primary election losers from running in the general election as independents. Not long after the election, Mrs. Porter was diagnosed with a cancer that swiftly took her life. She died in February 1967 at the age of 53. And the enormity of the loss was registered widely in the local press and in the collective memory of her colleagues. Environmental activist and radical journalist Virginia Brodine delivered a eulogy that pointed out how Mrs. Porter turned her experiences on the margins into social movement assets. In our society, that she was a Negro might have limited her, that she was a woman might have limited her. Instead, she used her experience as a woman and as a Negro to teach, to lead, to enrich the lives of men and women, Negro and white, to help them brush aside the limitations that hold them back, the barriers that separate them, she said in the eulogy. Years later, Gwen Giles, uh, the first black woman elected to the Missouri State Senate and the person who had been the campaign manager for Ruth Porter's 1966 uh, representative uh, campaign. Uh, Gwen Giles echoed these sentiments in reflecting on Porter's influence on her own political clear career, claiming, Ruth was probably the one person who gave more people the feeling that it was possible to get into a traditional power system that had kept women, especially black women, in low level positions. Other retrospectives give Mrs. Porter considerable credit for shaping the outcomes of fair housing and urban renewal fights in St. Louis, sometimes obscuring the degree to which the accomplishments of organizations like the FOR and WECC were the result of activist coalitions with many points of leadership, rather than Mrs. Porter's work alone. And perhaps those gentle distortions indicate how difficult it can be to apprehend the influence of activists who work largely in informal settings like voluntary committees, community forums, and neighborhood events. But in venues such as those, and in ways that are not always easy to document, Mrs. Porter established organizing agendas, changed minds, and forged personal bonds. And this in turn sparked action and commitment among a widening circle of area residents, both during her life and for many years thereafter. Over recent decades, the Ruth C. Porter Mall has experienced neglect, neglect and deterioration. And the West End neighborhood in which it sits bears scars of disinvestment that disfigure many neighborhoods in the city's north side. 
And had not, uh, had Mrs. Porter not done the bridge work that she did, that might be the end of the story. But the mall has seen revitalization. The neighborhood can continue to boast of the strength of its community institutions and the grandeur of its built environment. During her lifetime, Mrs. Porter inspired a sense that positive change was imminent in the face of mounting dismay over the future of urban neighborhoods and race relations in the St. Louis region. The fact that this hope lives on today may be traced, at least in some small measure, to the unusual force and dedication of her vision. And thank you for letting me share my work. Okay, that's it from you guys. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, let me see. Thank you very much. Uh, let me, I just quickly, I is a uh, senator of uh, May. Uh, I don't see your name, her name. Uh, I, okay, so we'll just, uh, like I said, uh, in case she has been on, you know, the, uh, this was, uh, well, as you say, the Cabinet History Project has been doing hi the history of the neighborhood. Uh, and when we saw that Senator May had uh, uh, in this, had passed, moved and passed legislation recognizing uh, March 26th uh, today as Empowering Black Women's Day. Uh, we decided that uh, having Dr. Izzo speak about Ruth Porter, just one of the many uh, active uh, women, uh, Black women, as well as white women, in the uh, St. Louis history, we decided to come together. So uh, she really was the spark that uh, brought this all about. And I'm sorry that she apparently can't make it. Uh, she had something already scheduled. Uh, so let me look at the chat. Where is that? Uh, okay. We don't have any questions yet, Robert. Okay. If you have a question or comment, you can go ahead and enter it into the chat at this time. Um, uh, well, let me just, uh, while we wait a little bit, what was the, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, Senator Giles, well, as you said, was the uh, campaign manager for Ruth Porter. Can you say a little bit more about their relations? Well, I, I can't, Robert. I can't say too much because I haven't been able to document that piece of the story that much. Um, so this uh, article is part of what I hope will become eventually a small biography of Mrs. Porter, mm -hmm. um, and I'll be able to expand it. And so there's a lot of, I think, unanswered questions about that political campaign. It was, I think, a tremendously um, impactful campaign for the people who were involved with it and also tremendously disappointing. Uh, obviously, uh, but I don't have a lot of documentation on their relationship. Um, there is the, the big challenge of this project is that there wasn't much out there at all about kind of Mrs. Porter's kind of inner life, anything like that. Everything I, I found here, I had to construct from the archives and I was able to interview uh, her two living children, her daughters. Um, but there isn't a lot of material out there um, that gives us, you know, that I, I'm gonna have to dig harder to find out more about um, how Mrs. Uh, Giles uh, encountered M Mrs. Porter, um, you know, and, and where they went from there. Um, because this is a tremendously exciting time for black politics in St. Louis more generally. Um, so there was, a, I think there's a big story there about getting a purchase and, and making uh, inroads into electoral politics uh, at the community level. Um, so there are not uh, at this point that I know of, I'm responding to a uh, question in the chat, uh, thinking Ms. Prowl, uh, any books about Mrs. Porter's life? There are, are not, to my knowledge, any books about uh, Ms. Porter's life. Um, the information that you can find out there is um, there's kind of short biographical profiles on some websites, um, but there's there's not much in the way of publication. 
Um, Rosalind Mitchell asks, do you know if housing loans like Fannie Mae derive from Mrs. Porter's efforts? Um, I can't speak to that specific, um, the question of how lending practices changed with the work of the West End Community Conference, but I do know that um, there, there were, um, that this, this question of um, federal mortgage guarantees and, and federal support of housing conservation in the Northwest um, part of the city did come about as a result of that activism. The degree to which um, there's a relationship of Mrs. Porter's work, I, I don't know specifically about that. That's another one of those things that, that deserves further research. Robert, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, I know that sure. the um, the West End Community Conference would thrive for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it was started in the mid 1950s, and I believe it survived at least until the the 1990s. Do you know anything about? Um, did it just kind of um, did it dissolve, or do you know do you know what happened to it? Um, well, it, it, that's an interesting question. I, I there's uh, the St. Louis Public Library uh, downtown has pretty good information about what they did in the 50s, but uh, you know they don't seem to have much for the 1960s. But it was very active then. They got a, I believe, a, a HUD loan to which to do a lot of urban renewal, um, and that was pretty massive. But I haven't sort of, I haven't put in, uh, in enough time to to track that. But they. Uh, did a lot of work in the neighborhood. Uh, I, uh, Gwen Giles was very involved in that. And so that's where I was hoping at some point to see, you know, if we had minutes, we could uh, figure out like, what were they deciding to do? Who was doing what? Uh, Marie Fowler, uh, you, you must have run across her. Um, uh, she, I believe, became the director uh, in the late 60s, I'm not sure, and she was pretty much active. Uh, the When the Young Hebrew Men Association uh, building, um, uh, when they moved to the West County, that became a city building, and the West End Community Conference had an office there. Again, I probably, I, I fear that like when that ended, they may have thrown all the records out or something, but um, they were they were pretty active, like you said, into the 90s, I think actually into the beginning of the 21st century, uh, but somewhere around there about the time that maybe Marie Fowler was retiring or so forth. So um, yeah, it, it, there, there's government documents that are pretty, well, I found them a little bit you know, sterile. I couldn't sort of who was doing what, and so that that is a big area. I'm sure there's some stuff out there, but I don't know if it's it's probably all spread out. I if there are people out there in the neighborhood whose parents maybe were involved, uh, uh, you know, whatever, and they have that, uh, we'd love it. I'm sure Cabinet Library would uh, love it. They said. Uh, history. So I, I haven't spent enough time to start to really put it together. So I apologize. Sort of one of my retirement projects I haven't got to. No, that's that's interesting to know. And I'm glad that, you know, get the word out that yeah. these are histories. I mean, there's all sorts of histories of this neighborhood that, that haven't been collected yet and haven't been preserved. So, you know, if folks have things in their attics and stuff, like don't throw that out. You know, so. um, Irma Lawrence, who I, I'm trying to remember, uh, the Northside Preservation project. She was also active. Uh, she has a lot of records that the State History Society of Missouri uh, has. And uh, now that the pandemic is uh, fading, I hope to get up to see those. And, and I, that, uh, that may have a lot. She seems to at least have saved a lot and the family generously donated it to the State Historical Society. Okay, there are a couple of other questions in the chat, one that I can answer and one I cannot. 
Um, uh, looks like Walter uh, Bonner, thank you for asking. Uh, this is the one I can answer. Are any of Mrs. Porter's children still living in the area? Uh, no. Her children, um, her youngest daughter, Diane, went to Washington University um, during the time that, that Mrs. Porter was active here. So she lived here then, and then she moved to the West Coast, where she, I believe, still lives in San Francisco. Uh, Diane Porter became uh, a, uh, a producer, I believe, at um, the public uh, television station in San Francisco, and I believe she also won an Emmy for that. So Mrs. Porter's children uh, were is distinct, you know, the, uh, are deserving of their own chapters in this biography in terms of the uh, distinctions of their family that they carried on. Uh, her eldest daughter, Janice, uh, Janice Gump, uh, lives on the East Coast of the US. She never moved to St. Louis, um, but she became an eminent uh, therapist, a psychotherapist, um, published um, widely um, and very active in uh, the profession and in creating some, some fairly innovative um, kind of theoretical work on race, gender, um, and mental health. Uh, their, their middle child, William, who's called Lance, I don't know much about him. Uh, he died an untimely death. He died fairly young, um, but does not live in the area either. Um, a question from Rosalind uh, Mitchell, does the West End offer any housing grants for minority home buyers? Um, and that's not something I know too much about. So I, I do not know the answer to that question. Maybe somebody else here does. Um, Walter Bonner asked if the WECC is still an active organization. And I think not. I think that, um, uh, so uh, Robert mentioned Marie Fowler, uh, who also has a park named after her. Um, she passed, I believe, in the early 2000s. And it sounds like the organization may have kind of uh, dissolved with her. Um, uh, so sadly that that longstanding organization does not, uh, exist anymore. Um, if uh, I can speak to, uh, Rosalind's Mitchell, uh, th this is just developing, uh, but, uh, Invest STL, which is a foundation in St. Louis is developing a program. Uh, and I think I can announce it, Walter, uh, may back me up on this, but they are planning to, uh, in order to build generational wealth, they're planning a program, they're just getting a loan, I, I, getting it started, in which I believe it's, they're gonna give $20,000 to long-term, like since 2016, who have been long-term residents of the uh, West End and Visitation Park neighborhoods in order to you know, purchase houses, uh, invest in a business, uh, and a number of other things. So uh, that's just, we just heard about that Wednesday or Monday night, but that is a program in addition to a lot of other uh, programs, which are more general, but this is one that's specifically focused on West End Visitation Park. So I, I think this is a really hopeful, uh, it may be a year or so before going. So, you know, keep your options open. Okay, I don't think we have any more questions. I just, I, I, there's some, some uh, expressions of gratitude in the chat and I just want to express my gratitude to the folks that showed up. I'm so appreciative to get the chance to share my research like this. I hope that perhaps I have an opportunity to do it in person sometime in the future um, because I think her story is so interesting. There's so many pieces I didn't get to touch on. Um, and so we need to, to make these stories better known uh, in the area. Um, for sure. Um, I don't know if there doesn't seem to be any more questions. Um, we could perhaps uh, end the event a little bit early, um, unless there was something else uh, that you wanted to. Oh, I think we have uh, somebody in the. I think somebody oh, in the has very joined. good. Wonderful. Uh, Senator May is here. Uh, Senator, can you? Uh, Okay, I think you're ready to go. Uh, yes. All right, very good. I'm glad uh, you could make it. So I, am, uh, I appreciate the invite. I don't know how to turn on my camera. That's what I'm trying to find out here. It's uh, down in the lower left-hand corner on the- uh, For some reason, it's, for whatever reason, it's not showing. 
Okay. Uh, should I join as a panelist or an attendee? Uh, Senator May, go ahead and try again. See if you can start your video now. Okay, should I stay as an attendee or a panelist? A panelist, please. Okay. Uh, Carrie, so that's it. I can't start my video because I've been disabled to do that. Well, okay. Try, try it one more time, Senator May. Okay, there we go. Okay. Can you see me? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Very good. In your car. Yes, well, I am. I have like so many events, and I just had one event of my own. But I just want to say good afternoon and just talk about a little bit about the holidays that I proposed. Um, I had proposed this holiday back in 2021, and I was very happy it passed. Um, this day, specifically March the 26th, uh, recognizes the legacy of Wendy Giles, a former state senator in this district and a giant in the rich history of the city of St. Louis. Ms. Giles passed away on March 26, 1986. So this day was selected to honor her legacy. Uh, we specifically recognize it because of how well she epitomized the idea of a pioneering black woman. So she fought through diversity and tragedy and ultimately left a legacy that touches Americans nationwide. She graduated from Washington University and St. Louis University. And then she went on to enter the political arena. She served as the director of the Civil Rights Enforcement Agency in the city of St. Louis. After that, she turned her aim to the Missouri Senate. When her time ended as a Senator, Gwen Giles was accomplished but not satisfied. She became the first woman in African-American to be appointed to the St. Louis city assessor. She was truly a trailblazer and I stand here before all of you because of the work of Gwen B. Giles and so many women like her who have braved the battles we've won and even in the face of a carious resistance. I am proud to honor this day, Pioneering Black Women's Day. So I'll be happy to take any questions or anything like that, but I just wanted to say this is a great day today. Uh I agree, and thank you for putting all that effort in. Uh, while we wait for questions, uh, we have a personal connection to her, uh, like family uh, of that sort? No, actually, when I ran for office, they told me the seat that I'm holding right now, I'm only the second woman to hold this seat in 40 years. And the first one was Wendy Giles, who was the first Black uh, woman in the Senate. So, yes. So that's why it became significant to me. So you, you personally reaching out and connecting to that history. Well, that's wonderful. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you, Senator, for your address. That was really beautiful and inspiring. And I think that anybody out there or anybody that knows college students, uh, Senator Giles needs to be the next one to get a good article and book uh, because there's not enough information accessible out there about her and her amazing, exactly. amazing accomplishments. Yeah, she died, you know, early. She had, she suffered from cancer, so she died early. So, and I think that it's important to, uh, especially for young African-American girls to see uh, themselves in certain positions. Um, mm -hmm. Too often, you know, we don't have um, um, icons that we can look up to and we have to see ourselves and our own images in certain positions. And it gives you kind of a, a um, you know, a wind beneath your wings to try to achieve something greater. Mm -hmm. And knowing that you can, it's a yes, you can moment. Do you happen to know whether she's got uh, papers, you know, her records, were they uh, saved or donated to some history organization, uh, anything of that nature? I do not know, but I know that she does have a grandson and he actually lives in my district. Oh. Um, yeah, but I don't know if she got papers or anything like that, but I know that she was also the, um, 
she was also the campaign manager. Um, he had 16 campaigns. Wimby Giles was a uh, uh, William Lace, William uh, Congressman <laughs> William Bill Clay Sr.'s campaign manager oh. for those 16 times he ran. I think uh, his was the first. So she managed Ruth Porter's campaign in 1966, and then uh, Bill Clay was the next one that she managed. Wow. Of course, he, you know, he uh, was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, and that was a monumental um, civil rights victory for St. Louis. So that was kind of her second political campaign. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, if if you could put us in uh, cabinet history in touch with your uh, with this uh, Gwen Giles uh, grandson. Uh, we'd be happy to talk to him and, and see if he's got any records, any memories he wants to share. Uh, that would be uh, really good. We'll try to interview him. I would, I would do that. Please right. contact my office and I can definitely put you in touch with them. All right. Very good. Yes. Well, if we don't have any questions, I do have two other events I need to get to because I have to present some uh, resolutions at those events as well. Okay. Very much for making your time. I appreciate it and, and thank you in the day. Thank you for thank your you service. so much. Thank right. you for having me. Thank you. You're good. Bye bye. Bye. And Robert, those are all the questions we have today. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, if you think of anything, uh, Cabinet History is uh, our email address, cabinethistory at gmail.com. Uh, let me know if uh, you got suggestions for next year, March 26th. Uh, maybe we can do a talk on Gwen Giles uh, or some other leading uh, Black women leader. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much and happy Women's History Month. Thank you very much. All right. Bye.